study this past week, read my Bible, and uh, I come across this portion of Scripture. I was actually looking at the study of the rock. I was studying the rock, and I come across the story of Hannah, and uh, the verse, if you look at the verses we're going to look at this morning for the message is over in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, but I want to kind of lead up to it. I want to see, talk about prayer. You know, Wednesday night, a lot of times we talk about prayer and how hard prayer can be sometime and how our prayer life goes. And, and um, what's your prayer life like? Are you, are you, are you satisfied with your prayer life? And most people say, yeah, not really. I, I think it could be better. I could do better in my prayer life. Maybe, maybe be more consistent. Maybe be more specific. And there's different ways you can look at it. But um, we pray and we expect. But I, the question that comes to my mind, and I was just looking at and reading this portion of Scripture, um, do I pray with my head or with my heart? Uh, if, I, if I pray with my head, uh, we all know the answers to the questions, right? God is in control. God's will be done. And we look at all those God answers prayer. We know all those things. And we know that up here. But do we know it down here? There's a, um, <clears throat> I read a story um, last week, and I got e get emails all the time from different Christian groups, and, that, and they had a story in there about this 76-year-old man who was a Christian, <clears throat> and he went to the preacher and he said, you know, what is wrong with my prayer life? He said, something is wrong. He said, I, he had some kind of illness and they didn't say, but he said, I prayed and prayed and prayed for God to take away this illness and he hasn't done it. He just won't do it. He said, I keep praying and praying and God won't do it. See, he was praying with his head. He knows that God answers prayer and God is able to heal. He just can't figure out why he won't do it. And, we, and one of the problems we run into is we have this false teaching out there that if you name it and claim it, you can have it. Well, that's not true. God works in our lives and our ways and in, in situations in our lives in ways that we don't understand. But it, the idea is that we need to believe it in our heart that God can do all those things. But then we have to go a step farther than that. It's called trust in him. See, I don't, know, I don't know what God has in mind for my life and your life. As Larry was just talking about the future, well, if you remember, as he talked about that, the thought come to mind, well, you know, your past was once your future. You went through that time, and so now you're looking ahead. But that past you was once your future. And so as we look and understand, as we pray, we pray for things, and there's nothing wrong with pray for healing and praying for all these different things in our life, but understanding that God works in his way and in his time. So we don't know that we'll even see the answer to some of our prayers. Sometimes it happens after the person lives, leaves this whole world. I, uh, just to reflect back, if you remember Darren Compton, there's people that got saved after he died because of his testimony, his witness while he was alive. See, so things happen and we don't understand why God works the way he does. But I have to understand that, that God is at work in all these situations and circumstances in my life. And so I live it out as God is working in me. I don't understand it all, don't try to understand it all, but I know that he does all things well, and so I trust him, and that's where we have to be. So with, just like this 76-year-old man and anybody else, uh, I go through this life and I pray and I bring these things out before God, but if you notice the title is, what happens when God answers my prayer? How do you respond? And you know, if you stop and think about it, we actually have a very small response to the miracles God does in our life. We come to church, and we might pray, hey, uh, I prayed this, uh, you know, my wife, she's always doing this. I lost my keys, I prayed, and God found my keys for me, okay. Well, that, that's all good, but the idea is that, you know, that's, that's within the local group. You know, we come together on Sunday morning, and, and we're believers, we all get together here, and we worship together, and, uh, but what about those people out there? They're the ones that need to hear what God's doing in their life. See, they're the ones that need to know that, as I talked earlier, it's not coincidence, it's not just happenstance or luck. No, and, and we use and I know we use those terms sometimes. Well, he was sure lucky. Well, we understand what we're saying, and the world doesn't always understand that. So we understand that God's in control. So as I look at this portion of scripture, we're, talking, we're going to talk about Hannah, and I want to get over those uh, last two verses. But I want you to stop and think about: Are we, are we praying with our head or with our heart? Am I really believing? It kind of gets to salvation, doesn't it? 
Remember, we talk about that when we try to lead people to Christ. And is it, is it a, a mental ascent? Uh, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ lived. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. See, that's, that's mental. What happens is I have to repent, and that comes from up here, down here, and then I believe it. See, I can have all kinds of things in my mind that I know, but that don't mean it's part of me. And that's why the same way with the prayer. I know all these things about God, but do I accept it? Do I trust that he's going to take care of me and do what I want him to do? And he doesn't always answer the way I want him to. Would you believe that? He doesn't do it in the right time. He doesn't do it in the right way. And that's why I walk by faith and not by sight. So we're going to look at this prayer, and we're going to believe and trust that God knows the best. And so we see Hannah. You're familiar with Hannah. She's a, uh, she was wife of Elkanah. He had two wives. And so I'm going to just read, uh, let's read the first 10 verses of Samuel chapter 1. I'll read down verses uh, 1 through 10. Let's give you a little background. Now there was a certain man of Ramatham, Zotham, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoth, the son of an Ephratite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts and to, in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered his, uh, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all his, her sons and her daughters portions, or gave them something, gifts. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, or double, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord has shut up her womb. And we know that was, that's kind of a curse back in that day and time not to be able to have children for a woman. And her adversary also provoked her uh, for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. That's the other wife. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, uh, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And here she goes, here's her prayer. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaiden. And remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. It's kind of the Nazarite vow there that she's making. She's going to commit him to the Lord. And she said that she's going to he's going to live like a Nazarite. See, she's, she's specific in her prayers. And sometimes I think we fail to be specific in our prayers. How do you know that God answered your prayer if you're not telling him exactly what you want him to do? And we pray, we pray general prayers, and I do it all the time, and you do too, uh, when we do our prayer meeting. I pray for the, the people around the world, Christians around the world, being persecuted for their faith, that God will take care of them, meet their needs, give them a peace, and all those. Well, that's not being specific. I know God works in different ways in different lives. But when you have someone that's sick or someone that's, that's passed away in the family, you have a specific prayer that you want to pray. You pray for healing, you pray for comfort, or whatever the situation calls for. See, we need to be specific in our prayers. Then we can see the answer when God answers our prayer. Over in Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. So we see the Holy Spirit, he's working in us, he's, he's praying for us in this situation, but he's specific in what he's asking, what he wants to do. And so we see here she had a, a baby, she named him Samuel, which means ask of God. And she not only made the request though, but she said, you know what, Lord, I, I'm given conditions. Lord, if you will do this for me, this is what I'll do for you. If you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you for your use. We do that all the time, don't we? People do that all the time. Lord, if you will just heal, if you'll just strengthen, if you'll just provide, this is what I'll do. So, but do we always do it? Do we always do what we say we're going to do? She, she made a vow. 
she makes a vow, and God, God takes vows pretty serious. When you make a vow to God, he, he takes it pretty serious. And we, we promise to one another, we promise, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't do what we should. But, but God says, if you make a vow to me, you, you're better off not making it if you're not going to keep it. So we see this prayer, and she, we see the prayer, it's a very simple prayer right there in verse 11. So let's go over to verses 19 and 20 in this uh, same chapter. Verse 19 and 20, and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And now kind of knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about Hannah, <coughs> about after Hannah had conceived, she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. So we see God answered her prayer, didn't he? He responded. She had that prayer. She made that vow. And so he answered her prayer. Go on down to verse 26. I'm not reading all these. You can kind of catch up with it sometime if you want to. And she said in verse 26, O Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped. And, she, and he worshiped the, the, the Lord there. She said, here, here I'm, I'm giving him back. At the first case, she says, uh, he whom I have obtained by petition shall be returned. That's what the word lent mean there. She, she, she petitioned God, and God gave her, the son, gave, him, gave her the son, and now she's giving him back to him. She kept him about three years. If we read the text, until he was weaned. Then she took him back down, and she gave Sam. This, uh, you ladies especially... Okay, it, especially if you've had trouble getting pregnant and having a baby, and, and you finally have a baby and you have a son, and you have this baby and you love him and you care about him and you get to keep him three years, and now you're going to take him back and say, Here you go. Here, Eli, he's going to serve the Lord here. How easy do you think that'd be? Hmm? But see, she made the vow. And so she's faithful to her vow. She knows that God blessed her. God answered the prayer. This is what she asked. She asked for, in fact, she asked for a man child. And she just asked for a baby. She said, I want, a, I want a man child so I can give him back to you. And God gave her a son, gave her, gave her Samuel. And so she's come back down here to Eli now after he's weaned, and she's going to uh, give him back to God. In Ecclesiastes, go over in Ecclesiastes here, verses. Chapter 5, verse 46. Uh, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was error. Oh, I didn't mean that. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hand? <clears throat> So we see what happened here. She, she's made the vow and she's kept the vow. So you might keep in mind when you pray to God, say, God, if you do this for me, this is what I'll do for you. Be sure you do what you said you would do. See, this, this because you don't make it, I vow or I promise, it doesn't mean that it's not uh, something that you need to be responsible for. When we deal with them, God is serious, people. God is serious about sin. He's serious about sanctification. He's serious about all these aspects of our life. God is a serious business because, you know, it's the difference in where you're going to spend eternity. And not only that, it depends on how, you, how you're going to spend eternity. See, when we, when we think about the life of a Christian, it's, it's not only the, the, the life down here that we're looking for, is it? What does he tell us over in, in uh, Colossians chapter 3? Focus on the things above. Because we're going to be in glory for a long time. And so what we do down here from the time of salvation till the time of the rapture or death, at that time that we're down here, we talk about the rewards and loss of reward, that all carries over to glory for eternity. So we understand that we need to be mindful of that, and God is serious about that. So when we get out of this world and we go before him, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we have the reward or loss of rewards, that goes on then. Into eternity. So that, that plays a part in what we have in heaven. I know heaven is perfect, heaven is great, but there are, are different roles, there's different responsibilities in heaven. And so we need to be serious about our prayer life, we need to be serious about our walk with the Lord and how we respond to the Lord. 
And so then I want to go a little bit further. And the, she wrote a, and we're not going to go through the, the whole uh, song that she sang here in chapter 2. She wrote a song, and if you remember, when uh, the uh, Israel went through the Red Sea, uh, Miriam wrote a song, and Moses had a song, and David had a song, and there's different songs in the scripture, and she wrote this song. This was a result of her, of what God had done for her. So let's go to verse, uh, chapter 2, verse number 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over my enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. So what is it she's talking about there? God delivered her from all this persecution that she was facing from this other wife and from the, the uh, curse of the uh, being barren and couldn't have children. God had taken all that away from her, and she's praising him now. She's writing this song to praise God. So it gets back to what I talked about earlier. When God answers our prayer, how do we respond? What are the results of our prayer? Do people see God at work in your life? How many people can look and say, well, I see, can talk about you and say, yeah, I see what God did in their life. I remember them telling a the story about what God did for them. See, if we don't tell anybody, if we don't share what God is doing in our life, how do they know? How do we know? We share with one another. We come to church and we share with one another and we pray with one another and we do those things. And that's all well and good. But see, the world out there needs to know how great our God is. We know how great he is. We understand he's the creator. We know all this. I just read yesterday, did you know that the earth is 4.3 billion years old? Did you know that? Yeah, it, 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 back 4.3 billion, something started moving on this earth. And that something started growing. And over the next billion years and billion years and millions of years, it started, and then here we are. We only, only took 4.3 billion years to make me. Hmm? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That goes along with what we've seen over in Paris. Now. This, the, the world is crazy. We have a book that, this is the book of truth, and it tells it just like it is. And we know we have this great God. She recognized, Hannah recognized God. She re, the result was this prayer, this song that she sang to him. It goes to verse 2, and we're going to close with verse 2. This is the one I want to get to. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. There is no rock like our God. I... Uh, I like, to, I like to read what she said here because she said, it's, it's holiness. What's it mean to be holy? A little quiz. You, just think, you don't have to answer. Just think in your mind. What's it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart, don't it? It means to be set aside, be set apart for God's use. That's what we are. As, we're holy as Christians. He tells us in Scripture over in Peter, he tells us to be holy as thou art holy. We're to be holy like God is. So you know how, God, how holy God is? He is, he is perfect holiness. Perfect me has the idea of being complete. God is complete holiness, and he's, he wants us to be completely holy. Well, we know that's not going to happen until we get to glory. But we need to be working at that. We need, this process of sanctification that we're going through from the time we're saved, we need to be working at being more holy, if I can use that term. We need to be, as we develop and as we mature in the word of God, we need to be more and more set aside to the use of God. So many times uh, Christians get the idea that when you get to a certain age, uh, you can just kick back, well, I've done it. You know, it's kind of like working, going to work, and you finally get to the point, I can retire, I don't have to do that anymore. Okay? But as a Christian, listen, as a Christian, God does not have a 401k. God does not have a retirement plan. Mm -mm. God never says, okay, it's okay for you not to sit in the pew and collect dust. No, he never says that. He says, you know what? You keep going until you cross the finish line. Once you break the tape, once you breathe your last breath, then you don't have to do anymore. But until then, and there's getting to be fewer and fewer Christians, you know that, don't you? Fewer and fewer true Christians. We live, we live in an environment today that you can't tell by the denomination or by the name on the door whether it's a true church or not church of Jesus Christ. It's a church. All a church is is a gathering of people. Ecclesia. It's just a, it can be any group. I just, I just read the other day where this, uh, the Presbyterian USA, they had a vote. Two to one, they voted to ordain homosexuals as pastors and preachers. Two to one. And I just use them. You know what's going on in the Methodist church, and, and the Baptists are no better off. 
See, what you can't say, well, I'm a Presbyterian, say, well, you know, I know what they believe. No, you can't say that anymore. You can't say, well, I know there's a Baptist, I know what. No, you can't say that anymore. Names don't mean anything. See, so we don't know who the Christians are and who aren't Christians as far as their affiliation. So what we need to do is we need to be an example. We need to tell people about Christ. We need to share the truth of the gospel about Jesus Christ. And so that's what she's doing. She said, God is holy. And he, calls, he said, listen, Christian, I want you to be holy. I want you to be an example for this world around you that people see you and see there is a difference in the way you react and respond to the temptations and trials in this world around you. I want you to take a stand for righteousness. I'm not talking about polit- political stand. I'm talking about for righteousness. That you take a stand for, for God and for the truth. That you're not, you're not one of those that, that take the Bible and twist and say, well, under certain circumstances, this sin is okay. No. The Bible is objective truth. There's no circumstances. When God says thou shalt not, he means thou shalt not. Now, I understand circumstances play a part in what happens in people's lives. But sin is sin no matter how you got into it and how you're dealing with it. It's still sin. And she says, God is holy. He's a holy God. What's to say? There is none holy as the Lord. There's none like him. And then there's none beside thee. The second part he talks about, none beside me. He's, he's unique. You realize he's the only one that can answer prayer? There's all kind of gods out there. People say, we all serve the same God. No, we don't. I like it over in, in the, was it the 44th chapter of Isaiah, I believe it is, where he talks about that the guy went out and he gets this, gets this, stone, this stump and he carves it up and he takes some, some of the wood and he, he cooks his supper and he cooks some, takes some of it to heat himself and he, does all this, and he has this little chunk of wood left so he bows down and worships it. See, that, that, those gods are out all over the place. And we think, well, that's pretty stupid. Well, people bow down and worship their possessions. They worship their power. They worship all the other things in life, don't they? It's the same thing. There's no power in it. She said, only God can answer my prayer. Only God allow, could take that barrenness away and allow her to get pregnant. Only God can do that. And that's why we need to be so out there telling people, this is something that God has done in my life. Only God can do that. For his holiness. Isaiah, I got some of them. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There is no other God. I don't care what people say or what they want to worship. I, I just heard over at the hospital. Well, if you have enough faith, it doesn't, doesn't make it, 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 the object of the faith wasn't even mentioned. If you have enough faith, well, there has to be an object of your faith. You have to believe something. And we know that the faith is in God. Our faith has to be in God and God alone. So just having faith is the object of your faith. What do you really believe in? What do you trust in? And we see God says here, you know, I am God. There is no other People raise up other gods. They bring up idols between me and you, between me and him. But the idea is that they're not true gods. I like what he said about Dagon, the, the uh, Philistine. He said, you got to pick him up. you got to take him over here. you got to save him here. He can't go. He can't see. He can't hear. He can't move. you got to do everything for him. Guess what? We've got a God that can do everything for us. We don't realize how good we got it. If you're born again, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're born into the family of God, I want to tell you what, we have it so great you can't even imagine it. We have a God that can take care of us no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the world throws at us, God can still take care of us. We talk about all the things going on in the world today. We talk about our nation and turmoil in our nation, all the things, all these people coming into our nation, and, you know, there's terrorists coming into our nation, all these things going on. Guess what? He's still in control. They, they will do nothing in this nation unless God allows it. 9-11, those planes just didn't go into that tower. God allowed that to happen. They didn't go against, they didn't go against God allowed those things. And you say, well, why would God ever allow something like that to happen? Stop and think about what he did to the nation of Israel. Hmm? 
He took the, 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 the Jerusalem, the city of David, where his, he had his temple down there, and there was the, the Ark of the Covenant was down there, and he allowed the Babylonians to come in there and destroy it all, except for the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't destroy that. But he allowed them to come in and take all his people captive. Hmm? Why did he do that? Because you know what? God hates rebellion. God hates idolatry. And when you put anything between you and God, you're just like being unfaithful in the marriage. See, we're truly married to God. And so God looks at us and he says, you know what? I, I'm not going to put up with that. And so sooner or later, he, he'll, he, what is it they all saying? He'll give you enough rope to hang yourself. And God watches us, and he watches us as a nation, and we see all these things going on, but I'm, I know he's in control, and we need to do our part to, for righteousness. We need, now it's not set back. I'm not saying set back and don't do nothing. Don't say nothing, no. But I'm saying we need to be aware that God is truly in control and to allow him to use us as he sees fit. And guess what? We'll survive. We'll survive. Oh. Last part. There's... Any rock like our God, the rock. I started off when I talked, started thinking about the rock. I was over in Psalm 31, 3, and he said, the psalmist says, For thou art my rock and my fortress. And you know, that's on my license plate on my truck. Thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Lead me and sustain me. See, he is, he is the rock. What is a rock? A rock is solid. A rock is strength. And that's what we talk about. God is the rock. He tells us, I got some verses I'll share with you, and then we'll close. Over in Matthew chapter 7, familiar with these. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings to mine and doeth them, not just hear them, but do, does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And what happened? The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew. And beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. No matter what happens in our life, we are secure. I got to give me another. I'll give you another verse real quick. John chapter ten, verse twenty and twenty-nine. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Guess what? We are so secure. Our salvation is so secure, we stumble, we mess up, we do things wrong, we backslide and all this, but we are in God's hands and nothing can get us out of God's hands. See, it's not, it never, never, ever is dependent on how well we perform. Our rewards and loss of rewards, how we go through, that part is. But my salvation is never based on how well I perform. It's based on Christ and Christ alone, what he did on the cross, and my response to that by putting my faith and trust in that shed blood, and that shed blood alone as payment for my sin. So I have security. I'm on the rock. I built my foundation on the rock. I put my faith and trust in Christ. He is the rock. And Paul tells us over in 1 Corinthians, now you pay attention how you build on that foundation. You pay attention to how you build on that rock. But I know that I have the security because of that rock, because of who that rock is. Another scripture that came to mind as I was putting this together over in Hebrews 13, 6. It says, the Lord is my, so that we may say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man may do unto me. I don't have to worry about what man's going to do to me. God is my helper. He's going to take care of me. He's going to be with me through it all. He says right there in 13.5, I will what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means I'll never abandon you. I'll never leave you behind. See, what we have as Christians, and we fret and we worry. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. Don't need to worry about tomorrow because you know what? Tomorrow's going to get here anyway. And so what we need to do is we just walk by faith. And that's it. Listen, I say that and I make it sound simple, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge because you know what? I'm, I'm still in a fleshly sense here. I'm in a body like you and I. We have this corruptible body, this, this mortal body. You know, we have all the, the emotions that come with the body. So we have, to, we have to struggle to get past this flesh. We have to struggle to get past this walk in the, in, by sight and walk by faith. And it's the challenge for you and I. And so each day, each challenge, each situation, each circumstance, keep in mind, I am trusting in you and you alone, and I know that you will take me, you will guide me, you will direct me, and I like that over in Psalm 31. For thy name's sake. It's not for me. 
It's not for the preacher. It's not for the teachers. It's not for the deacons. It's not for the members. No, it's for God's glory that all this is done. You know, we, we do things, for, we do things and, and people appreciate and they thank him, and that's great. But you know what? I want, I want him to point up and say, you know, I thank God that you came and helped me. See, because he's the one that gets, needs the glory. Because I could do nothing without him. You realize that no matter what you do in your life, no matter who you help or how you provide or anything, you couldn't do that if God didn't supply that need in your life. Now, you have to be obedient to use it, but it's God to the glory. What's he say? There is no other God but me. And the sooner we recognize that and the sooner we respond to that, uh, the better that our walk in this world is going to be. Okay, the question is now, how do you, what are the results of answered prayer in your life? We started with that and we end with that. What are you going to do when God answers your prayer? And I want you to be specific. We talk about that all the time. Be specific. When you, when you ask a specific prayer, like Hannah asked a specific prayer, I want a man-child. And God said, here, Hannah, here's a man-child. What did she do? She gave God the glory, didn't she? She wrote this song, and it's been in the book now for over 2,000 years. People have been reading about what, <clears throat> what God did in Hannah's life. Can, they, can people look at your life and hear you say, God has done this for me. Not, we talk about our salvation, but I'm talking about what he does in this daily life, how he provides for us, how he, how he helps us, how he protects us. Do we tell people? Do we let people know this is what God is doing in my life? We're not super spiritual people. No, but you know what? God's at work with your life. He's doing, sometimes it's small things. Sometimes it's great things, big things. But it's always God. And that's who needs to get the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and for this time. We pray, Lord, that you've been blessed by the service this morning, by what we've talked about. Because it's been about you. It's all about you. From the day of our salvation, or even before that, you formed us in the womb. You brought us into this world. You protected us and kept us until we come to know Christ as our Savior. We can never thank you enough. We can never do enough to show our appreciation. We can never share our testimony enough to let people know what you've done for us. You're so good to us. And even we know we don't deserve it. We, we read in the psalm, I mean, the psalm 8, what is man that you're even mindful of us? <laughs> Compared to you, we're so insignificant. But you love us. You, we're so significant you sent your son to die on the cross. He shed his precious blood to demonstrate your love while we were still in sin, while we were still your enemies. Oh God, we just pray today for those that don't know Jesus as their Savior. They're, they're facing a condemnation for their sin. They're facing the judgment for their sin. And the judgment for sin is death, eternal separation from you. And the only way to avoid that You've done that work. You've made that possible. You sent your son to die on that cross and shed his blood. So by faith in, in that shed blood, and that blood alone is paying for our sin, we can have eternal life. Just believing that. So we pray, Lord, for those in our family and our friends that don't know Christ, that we pray this would be the day. Lord, that this would be the very hour that someone would speak to them, that someone has spoken to them, that seed had been planted to the day this, the seed might sprout and bring forth fruit, they might repent and put their faith in Jesus. And for those of us that are your children, may this be the time for us to, to reflect and look back at what you've done for us and be, be sharing uh, your goodness and your mercy and your grace in our life. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for this past week, all that you've given us the opportunity to share the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that the seeds that we sowed in this past week will bear fruit for you. We thank you and praise you for what you've done. Looking to the days ahead, Lord, for what you're going to do. We we'll thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, take your hymnals. Turn to 4 a.m.